All right, for this segment on education reform, uh, we have Mr. Natural, a character from like the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and such, um, based on a character, yeah, the underground comic um, character, Mr. Natural. Uh, so anything else, he's also a teacher, um, music, and uh, anything else to say about yourself, Mr. Natural? Yeah, hi, I'm Mr. Natural. Yeah, I started teaching in Chicago back in the 60s, actually, and then when I moved to San Francisco, I didn't have uh, enough uh, accreditation at that time, and I had to go back to school and take some classes, and then got my teaching degree here, and then I've been teaching here in San Francisco since uh, 66. Yeah. And you're mostly self-taught, right? I mean, there wasn't anybody who made Mr. Natural, right? You're kind of self-made. No, I'm, do I'm dodactic, like... <laughs> All the, all the real geniuses in the world. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, we basically agree on the, this general subject of, you know, the, the education system. Maybe we're just paying the wrong end or we're rewarding the wrong people. Uh, the students do the work. The students need the reward. They need the incentive. And having teachers trying to cram it down their throats for money uh -huh. doesn't make much sense when you could just pay the kids to learn it for money. No, you get you get what I call jazz, uh, the jackass. You know what happens is people get stubborn just because they can be stubborn, and that's not really a way to motivate people. You know, it starts with back in the 30s and 40s when they put together public education, they decided to use the uh, Pavlovian or the behavioral model. So they felt everything was based on either positive reward or negative incentives or competition. And so you're building an entire uh, knowledge base based on that faulty assumption about people. And they pretty much institutionalized that down through the decades. And that's what you get even today. And there's been some reform, but it swings back and forth. Then you've got the added problem of the politics of the school. You've got the unions. You've got, you know, what, what the, the, the politics of the teachers, which get in way, the fundraising and all the rest of that stuff. And it just, that's why I left public education, because I found myself doing everything but teaching. And I wanted to teach. You know? Yeah, I, I would argue that um, not only will it save a, a lot of money, like say if you just took te uh, one half of the money we spend now on education, which would be about fifty or sixty thousand dollars on average. That's half the amount, um, and use that as a prize for a kid to pass a GED, you know, a high school equivalency exam. That you would have high school graduates, you know, at the age of 12, there there would be a huge incentive for kids for because that's real money. I mean, they have tried systems where they give kids rewards, but they're usually war rewards that come to a glass of Coke or something. Yeah, well, a can of Coke isn't going to get a week's work out of somebody. Yeah, bribing doesn't work either. Yeah, well, bribing, I think, is it, I think bribery does work. It just has to be a very good bribe, that's all. Uh, well, it, well, see, but the thing with money is you can buy your own bribe, right? Try, giving someone a gift, you know, and trying to figure out is this the thing that fits them. So that's part of the problem with incentives in schools. You have to make sure your incentives are politically correct. You've got to... You know, run it past uh, the oh, principal. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. They used you, to have like prize money. Yeah, you give contests. Them digits in their bank account, and then they can spend it on what they need. It, you know, that makes more sense to me. And I found out uh, when I did this experiment myself back in the '70s that it had many more profound repercussions than I even thought. Um, it's you don't have to worry about positive or negative incentives because the money is both that. It's both positive and negative incentives. Um, in the 70s, 1973, I, there was a lot of alternative schools beginning here in San Francisco and opening up across the country. People wanted to try educating their children themselves, but they didn't know anything but the old system. So it was amazing when I went to a lot of the alternate schools I looked at, the parents just instituted another kind of public school, and, and sometimes it was more repressive and also dumber. Um, at the same time, back then, people were trying to get uh, education online, sort of, let, let more or less, that was selling discs or sets of uh, 
cassette tapes or stuff like that that would educate people and you saw that starting to happen the whole the ride tech and these new, these universities you see advertised all the time that 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 began happening and people were willing to spend money in private institutions or people outside of the institution because they felt they were being educated better or they were getting more of what they wanted but I decided when I went to the Board of Ed and wanted to start a school, they, they, didn't, they, did, they didn't like the idea of me opening a high school. And when I told them that I wanted to pay the students, they laughed at me. They actually thought I was out of my mind. So I made them a bet. The only way I could get my uh, credentials from them and get, at that time, I think it was uh, Howard Clay was the head of the Board of Ed here in San Francisco. I made him a bet that if he gave me 14 of the most delinquent students in the school and gave me six months, I'd give him good attendance uh, records after that. And so he had Mr. Goldblatt, the attendance officer at that time, uh, allowed me to start the school and he would come every day to take attendance and see what happened and see what I was doing at the process. Gary, after six months, every single child showed up every single day. We had perfect attendance, we had perfect attendance records. And it was simple. They got paid for coming to school, first of all. If they were late, they were doc pay, just like anybody else was doc pay. If they did extracurricular stuff or they taught a class, they were paid for that. They were paid for teaching classes. It was amazing in how often I could step out of the way and give a student I knew that knew English just as well as I did a chance to teach other kids and reinforce what they, what they themselves knew be able to, to describe it and explain it to others. Yeah, so, so, so I mean, it's kind of disturbing that, you know, when you, you could actually create the example, you know, you can actually prove the case, and the, but the institution is so settled in, you know, the, the vested interests are already own the system, and they're going to resist the change, so it has to be more than just right. You know, people really do have to force good things to happen sometimes yes. because there are forces that don't want it to happen. So They went out of their way to block us, actually, and I had to actually uh, have more accreditation than anybody else needed to open a school. I mean, there were hippy-dippies that were opening up schools, you know, that were based on sitting around meditating all day, and that was all right with them, you know. But when I said, oh, I'm just going to pay the students to come to school and we're going to do it normal. We're going to have a normal school. We're going to take on the 38 subjects. We're going to go through the four years of curriculum. You know, we'll do all the testing. We'll do the GED at the end and find out how the kids do. And it was absolutely amazing at how often they kept throwing roadblocks in front of me, constantly trying to stop that process. They didn't want us to prove it was feasible. Um, the amazing thing was, it worked better than I thought. We had those 14 kids that first came to that school were the most truant kids in the system. There was one kid, Jeff, I call him Jeff Runaway. Jeff Runaway was a professional escape artist. His parents would take him to school, walk him to the third floor, get him into the classroom, would stand outside of the door while the classroom started, and then would leave. And they'd get a phone call 20 minutes later saying, your son escaped school. He opened the windows, crawled down the drain pipe, and ran away. I mean, this kid was uh, an escape artist you wouldn't believe. Uh, one day, uh, Mr. Goldblatt was there taking attendance, and he noticed that Jeff had not come to class yet. He was late, and he started razzing me about my perfect attendance record. And at that moment, Jeff comes through the door with a cast on his leg. And it turns out that he used to run to school every day. And on his way to school that day, he got hit by a car. He dragged himself to the hospital, had the cast put on, and came to school an hour and a half late and apologized <laughs> when he came through the door. That's the kind of motivation money can do. Yeah, and, and, um, and you know, it's, it's just so obvious in some ways that we all are motivated, you know, it's, it's crude to say, but yes, it's the generic universal gift is money, okay? It does have this intrinsic and fundamental value. Um, you don't have to depend on what I, the person wants or what even you want. It's not, you know, it's even more valuable than actually getting something. Because it is, it's it always the promise of it. It's not even the actual something, right? I can I can imagine yes. money being anything, 
and at the same time also I never have it even when I have the money I still don't have the thing so the value is still there so I can't even have the disappointment of the day after syndrome or some other thing the idea of the promise of the of the pot of gold so to speak you know the leprechaun gold it's just this idea that money has this real intrinsic fundamental power to motivate us and and the real argument is is that yeah okay this is a little bit manipulative with kids but kids need to be manipulated sometimes they don't know what's good for them until they get a good taste of it and you, yeah you don't want to shove it in their mouth you want to you want to you want to get them to start eating it for you know for, for what they think are their reasons not because you're forcing them to, not because you're playing the game, but because they're going to own you in the end. And I think that's really important in motivating. And once you get a kid hungry for knowledge, you're not going to have to pay them in the end. I mean, that's the irony of it, right? Is that, you know, a system like this, you could almost not give them the money in the end. And it might be all right with the kids because they're going to realize the real gift was realizing how valuable knowledge is. Right, and as I mentioned to you in the past, the surprise to me was is when you see how they are handling money in a new way, it has real value because that money is based on their personal work product. It's the sweat and guts of their asses. That means something to them. Then when they spend it, they do not spend it foolishly. So they figure out what a dollar means. And that extends into other things, like only using enough intellect to learn what you need rather than overstudying. That also means that when you give a gift to somebody, you learn to receive that gift so it has value of the other person rather than saying, oh, thanks, I, I've always wanted that, you know, or it's about time. These ideas of value start cropping up in other ways in the way in which they're interacting socially in terms of how of much value they take the subject matter itself. They can see the intrinsic value an idea has rather than what it can buy. And it's interesting how this value creeping in changed their behavior, changed their relationship with their parents, changed their interactions as citizens within the community. And the, for me, uh, 40 years later, I'm still in contact with half of the original 14 of those kids and I have had the opportunity to see how it's changed their entire lives. They've gotten married, they've had children, and they've taken those same values, and they do the same thing with their own kids now. They make their kids work for the money. They teach their kids real value, and they don't just give things away or just take things. Yeah, well, that's sort of what happened, and I guess, in just to me, this idea occurring to me was what was the big thing missing? Because, yeah, I, I kind of just slobbed my way through school. I just did the bare minimum, whatever I had to do to get by, and um, without any passion for it at all. And I did see that later in life as a huge missed opportunity. Um, you know, I blame it both on me and the institution. The institution did nothing to, you know, give me any incentive to care. And, um, but yeah, but I did work when I was a kid, you know, from the time I was 11, I had jobs like painting, you know, uh, delivering newspapers and cutting grass and shoveling snow. And it did give you an understanding of money. Saving money became a, a, a rational thing to do. These are all really good incentive mechanisms. And, um, yeah, I think that's really important for a kid to learn too. So that's the second bonus of this thing is that you're going to, they're, they're going to learn the real world economy earlier and that's these kids do live in a fake world you, you know a lot of right. them a lot of them don't live in the real world because they have no sense of what it costs and what work is and what burden is oh yeah I, I always get a kick out of when I'm in a store and some kids pointing at the most expensive thing in the store asking their parents to get it and then start having a hissy fit when they can't and the parents can't seem to explain to them about value they can't m m get through to the kid about that That money is my work. It doesn't mean anything to a child that's been given something their whole life. So they need to work. They need, they need to do something that they can take pride in, that you can put a dollar value on, which they can then convert into whatever reward 
that suits their addiction. So it's like, you know. Yeah. So so another institutional problem I might bring up is the, is the way that we acquire this knowledge. I also remember that you know in school I would I would sneak my way by because you just say all you have to do is pass this week's test. Right. You know, so you don't have to really learn the material. You just have to get away. You have to learn it enough to to to, to get by on a test. And, and the great thing, I think, about having a test at the end, it's great to make sure a kid's getting it, you know what I mean, to progressively test as they're going. Wouldn't be any problem. I don't have any problem with that. But you really need some final test where you're not going to get any help. You're going to have to do the work. You're going to have to know the answers and how to, how to find the answers. And you might have learned it four years ago, and you're still going to have to know it. And I think that's a, you know, I think the idea of, I think even kids in regular school should have to take GEDs. They should have to take a test that basically tests for your equivalent knowledge. Well, as an alternative school, that was part of the deal. None of the kids could actually graduate or get accreditation from the school unless they took the GED. And they had to take it and pass. And if some of them preferred actually to go into the service, into the Army, and took the GED there because they were able to then get certain kind of training for electronics, the things that they wanted as well. So the bottom line was GED was absolutely the bottom line that you have to have to be considered, you know, uh, accredited or have a certain level of knowledge. What I've always objected to, though, is the way in which the knowledge is given across. It's always d delivered in a linear fashion. And people don't always think linearly. You actually have several different ways in which people relate through their five senses. Some people are very tactile oriented. Some people are very imaginative. Some people are very audio oriented. And I find if you want to convey certain knowledge to people, you have to find out what tactile sense they're the most attached to and sort of deliver it via that system. Well, and so you. One, one size does not fit all. You can't deliver the information exactly the same way to everybody. Right, and, and mood is also important. You know, you get into patterns of where you're in the mood to do something, and even as a kid, you could be like, you know, maybe mathematics intrigues you for two weeks, and that's what you'd like to devote your time to because you find it very interesting. And, and I almost found that to be a huge conflict, you know, just in, in being a kid when I was trying to learn some things, because some things you need to think about them more than you're really allowed to, because I still have an English assignment, or I have a history assignment, or I have some other assignment I have to do, so I can't work on this one. You know, and so you're distracting your brain from even doing it in a coherent manner where it completely learns something, you know, in, in one packet. I mean, this idea of multitasking education might not be a very good idea. The multitask should maybe should be by week or by month rather than a daily dose of a little bit of all these different subjects, which could be very dangerous to, I think, very destructive to the learning process rather than constructive. Yeah, they also have a very fixed timeline with each of these subjects, you know, and they go from A to Z. And I've also seen people who come in not knowing a subject get about a third of the way in, and there's one concept they do not get. And so they get stuck there. And by the time they finally figure it out, the class has already moved all the way up to P already, and now they're playing catch-up. And you never really graduate a class feeling as if you've really totally grokked a subject, that you're in charge of it. You always feel as if you're just living by the next coin, the next moment, the next thing, you know. I cheated my way through high school. I cannot spell to this day because a half an hour before every class, I would sit down and study that spelling list while I'm drinking a lot of orange juice to raise my IQ. I'd go in and I'd take that test, and I swear to you, 10 minutes after that test was taken, I couldn't spell one of the words that was on that damn list. But I got through with straight A's in high school, and to this day, I can't spell to save my life. But I figured out how to cheat the system. Well, that's that's yeah, what it comes down to. Yeah, and I had this, I had a very similar experience. I don't know whether it's dyslexia or what it is, but yeah, you know, definitely um, spelling. I was way behind. You know, switching states and all that kind of stuff. Lots of reasons, perhaps. Um, but yeah, you just compensate, you know, and, and, and then, you know, some of that, the system should notice. You, you'd say even why didn't even the system notice that? And if I had to actually do some. If, if I was required to take a certain kind of test, maybe I would have known that I would have to have more proficiency. You know, so I would have had to fix it 
if I knew something was on the line. So if I knew my, my 50 grand was on the line, I'm pretty sure I could have learned how to spell a lot better. Well, I as a teacher too, though, I, I look at those things now and I see them as the potential for genius. If a kid can figure out how to skirt the rules or get around something, there's some thinking going on there. Now what we need to do is figure out how to direct it in the right direction. Put it into something socially useful or something that's good for the, for the person uh, instead of being mischievous. So I've always seen kids who act up in school as being bored of school and probably too smart to be there. Kids who are running away from school constantly but keep going back and then they run away and they keep going back. There's a part of them that feels that they know socially in their life they're going to need to be educated so they keep going back but they just can't stand being there. They're bored spitless. So the first thing was to engage their brains and to almost overload everybody. The second thing is find out what interests the kids had and allow them to explore those even to the cost of other things. So like you were talking about mathematics. I had a kid who had a 4.3 grade average when he was in high school uh, for almost two and a half years and people, parents were always putting pressure on me and I, I, would, I wouldn't let them do that because I knew that when the kid was ready, I'd have to get out of his way. And one day he took a course in, in history of mathematics and saw it from a completely different point of view that was interesting to him. And then I used that to feed him. And Gary, in three months when he took the test, he went up to an 11.9. In three months, he caught up from, grammar, grammar, from fifth grade grammar school all the way through high school in just three months. That's what kids are designed to do, you know, that they have that type of focus and they have all this body chemistry and all this preconditioning, you know, helping them do that. You know, we kind of peter out as we get older. I wish I had <laughs> the ability to do uh, these miracles that I see kids do when they're interested in something. Well, I mean, I wouldn't underrate yourself. Um, you, you, did the, you did learn music. You learned how to read it, write it, and play it on many instruments, uh, you know, what, from your mid-50s? Yeah, in my 50s, I, I decided that after I had invented a new form of teaching music that I needed to experiment on me. <laughs> and uh, I always experiment on, on my students, but some of my students aren't as good a student as I am. And I know I can be a very good student. So I did that, and in, uh, uh, what, 11 years, I taught myself to play over 50 musical instruments using my method. So I know my method works, and now I'm seeing the product of it because my students are leaving here actually learning how to write music. Nobody leaves this institution just playing something by ear. They all write, they perform, they play, they encourage each other, they work together in collaborations to put together small ensemble groups. It's kind of amazing to see the interaction. I spend most of my time just trying to keep up with everybody, <laughs> really. I have to practice like nine instruments a, a, a week every, every day just to keep up with the kids that are coming through here. And if a new instrument comes through here that I haven't seen in years, I have to work hard to get my chops back up on it so I can teach them, right? And so that, that's that been, a, for me, kept my mind alive. I, I, I've always been afraid as I get older, I'd get that, uh, you know, that old people's disease of, you know, having everything, you know, what they call that having a, a pregnant moment or a senior moment where, where things drop out of your head. And so every single day I'm challenged to learn and I'm challenged to pass it on to others and I get to see other people's point of view of what I'm doing and the kids have taught me more about my own system than anybody could have because they'll do things like turn it upside down, turn it around, try to put it on a window and let, you know they do weird things with it and it's amazing the inventions that have come out of this thing that I've started doing I'm I'm just really excited yeah I mean so it's like I said that this is something I think it's just it makes common sense I think for and for people you know there really shouldn't be this 
this shouldn't be one of these things where the world has to fight about it. You know, we could create right. a national college, we could create a national high school, and, you know, we could videotape it all, put it all on cable TV, and every human being in this country, if they wanted to learn something, they could learn it from the best teachers in the world, all on videotape. You know, we, we could have, you know, and, and, you know, this is the way... It should be free, and I say for kids, we should be paying them. So adults should be able to learn for free, and kids should get paid to do it. You've just described what PBS was supposed to be. And they also didn't, they weren't commercial. Have you seen a PBS show lately that isn't touting commercials continuously, nonstop, forever and ever? I mean, it's just a shame. That's what public access television was supposed to be about. It was supposed to be about educating and passing on science and literature. I haven't seen, you know, I see things like on um, chakras and, uh, you know, and aura reading. On, <laughs> you yeah, know, well, well that was always another problem with it. It, it. it was publicly financed but only subsidized, right? So they still were dependent on grant money. They were still dependent on, you know, pleasing some constituency and so they ended up feeding that constituency so anybody who had a radical perspective tended you know to have more influence with public television you could sort of a rich guy could sort of buy the programming of choice and not saying that some of it wasn't good okay some Nova some of these frontline were they did have some integrity in the beginning but yet now it's just serving an audience again again it's 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 serving a special interest not a social interest and certainly as an educational platform they certainly dropped the ball in the sense that they didn't come up with any kind of educational programming for kids older than five years old right I mean it just kind of stopped at five years old and we're not going to help you any further but I don't think anybody could deny that Sesame Street you know did kids an awful lot of good and as a practical matter if we would have bought it in the first place you know what I'm saying if the government would have made it they would have owned it and it would have been even cheaper. I mean, you know, the fact was we were still paying somebody else to produce it. And if we produced it ourselves, like we land on the moon ourselves, we wouldn't be paying a bunch of other people for it. Yeah, we, we've done the same thing here in San Francisco with our dam. We built this dam to uh, dam up the water and to bring uh, power into the city. And then what did we do? We turned around and we gave the dam dam to uh, PG&E. California had the highest electric bill in the country not too long ago, and we found out we were being robbed by the very people who we built the dam for. So again, you know, public money comes in, and public people's backs and sweat come into building these facilities. They're taken over by a private institution, and then bad money pushes it out in the wrong, wrong direction. Yeah, yeah. Just, the, uh, uh, just, just one yeah. thing. We were talking about the money that influenced public television. Now, there's an example of how the money motivated incorrectly in the wrong direction and took over. Imagine if that money had been earmarked with the right spirit, with the right idea of what it should have been. That same amount of infusion of money could have transformed this television system to something that all of us at all ages. I knew adults that were watching Reading Rainbow because they were trying to learn to read because they didn't get phonics in school. When I went to school, they taught See It, Say It. So here were 40-year-old adults trying to figure out phonics for the first time. It, it's valuable, but they should be also including, as you say, classes for you know 10-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, and 50-year-olds. I mean, I'd love to see a class on geriatrics, because I still yeah. to this day don't know what to do with my own body. It just keeps surprising me. I want someone to tell me the whole story. Well, and we have the technology now, so it's not an issue. We can have as many networks as you can put, uh, you know, we can, as you can create. So that this isn't, a, there, there's no, there's nothing in the way, and you can keep it simple enough, stupid, so to speak. You know, keep it simply stupid, um, in the sense that you make this simple, easy goal. You make the goal uncorruptible. You know, the goal is you have to pass a test. You know, and there's no influencing that basic mission statement which is we this is a competency test and the competency test is going to require you to do this much math and this much comprehension and vocabulary um, and this much knowledge of history and that's and it'll be known quanta and uh, yeah the mission statement is is go out to these these things you'll have different 
pieces, different ways to learn. You could even have operas that teach. You know, there could actually be people write that write educational opera. There could be educational ballet. You could do ballet with flashcards. I mean, you know, it, it, it can be done in many innovative ways, and none of the duplication is going to hurt anybody, and none of the redundancy would hurt anybody, and we wouldn't have to pay for any of it. Exactly. Here we teach rhythm and language at the same time. I teach people poetry and to use uh, poetic schemes as a way to write music, for instance. So I find myself stealing from other forms of art, from architecture, from writing, from you know, language, from uh, uh, visual arts all the time, and then instituting that as some kind of a uh, audio lesson that we can do in music, and it's surprising at how well it adapts. So again, we don't have this kind of cross-knowledge thing going on either, in which people are borrowing from various forms of other subjects and sciences and sharing this information. Yeah, another element to this is this whole idea that why, why, why am I so passionate about it? I mean, I've been talking about this for 15 years. Um, is, is this is a social good? I mean, we have a society that is obsessed with sports heroes and celebrities. You got kids playing basketball because they want to be millionaires, and they have a one in 10 million chance of one in 20 million chance of achieving that goal totally unrealistic waste of time waste of their good energy um, being a nerd is a bad thing you know associating somebody with somebody who has book learning or has tried to educate themselves um, we have a, a society that is completely backwards in what it celebrates it doesn't celebrate real science it celebrates show science it doesn't celebrate people you know doing the work every day in the laboratories inventing things um, and you know this would be a way to turn that around to turn to, to give, we'd see it in the education system in that you're going to get rewarded for how you acquire and how you use information. And that this will be the con, this will be the court you want to play on. And I can guarantee you, you, I mean, we have an 80 to 90 percent, you know, dropout rate in cities like Chicago. All right, you know, I mean, obscene numbers. And, and you could say, you know, for a certainty. That if you if you had a fifty thousand dollar prize on the line, those kids aren't going to be dropping out. Okay, they're going to want that money because it's going to buy them out of poverty. It's going to buy their family out of poverty. And they're going to develop resources that they need to get out of that in other fields. Anything else they want to do, they're going to develop contacts with other people trying to do that that they may need in their life later. It it just has all kinds of side benefits that uh, affect everybody throughout the entire community. Well, I mean, well, we know <clears throat> life is an imposition. So someplace in this, we have to decide to, to help, to help ourselves and help others to eliminate some of that imposition. Teaching's the most important thing. Uh, uh, the, it's the quintessence of that. Intelligent people, violence goes down. You have intelligent people, baby rates go down. You have intelligent people, um, human things start to happen, services. You have intelligent people. Intelligence is the crux of a real, rational society and getting rid of some of the pain and suffering and this uh, inconveniences of life that we have. We can solve these problems one at a time, but education and the right kind of education is crucial to the, all of this. Yeah, well, understanding is a key word, right? I mean, understanding is everything, and understanding everything. does make you more compassionate, more understanding, more capable of, of doing good in the world, because you'll even understand the value of doing good, and you'll understand the value of knowledge, and again, you become addicted to it, and I think, I think the people watching this program are probably people who tend to be um, a little bit more educated and so I could say to you I could say to the person listening you get it don't you that yeah this is this is what made you a better person in your life was getting hungry for knowledge and then that's the real argument here is that all you have to do is get a kid hungry for it and he will acquire an appetite that will be insatiable all right, he'll keep looking and keep looking, and I'm, you know, I did it so late in my life, and I'm just saying it was a squandered childhood. 
uh, because of this you know institution we've created that has yes lots of people are getting a good paycheck out of it all right but it's not producing good people there's only one teaching method that works it's called query that is in, you know you, you want to get inquisitive inquisitive about something and then you want to research it and what happens is this curiosity and this curiousness that you have to look at anything you can to satisfy that hunger, that's what leads to greater knowledge. And we just need to figure out ways to encourage that in people or to let them do it on their own. I've educated myself because of an insatiable curiosity to know absolutely everything. Um, I, I, I just kind of think of myself as a guy who likes to stick his nose in everything. <laughs> well, well, if, if, I, if we had the free time, I think that's another thing somebody could imagine, that you would love to just go through all of the Internet. You know, there's a ton of information available, a ton of subjects I'd like to explore if I had the time to do it. And isn't that the irony, that I'm, you know, I'm so busy acquiring knowledge that I don't have enough time to acquire knowledge, you know. But that's the only thing keeping me away from it, is that the, the stuff of particular interest, um, you know, consumes my my all all my hard time and my leisure time it's my it's my recreation if I want to go on a vacation I'm gonna to go to the Einstein Institute so to speak I'm gonna to go to a place that's gonna show me something that means something I'm not gonna waste my time at the World Cup yeah people who tend to be self-educated I can see the internet is like a you know it's like a big ta-da like a big juicy candy bar for us but it, you for so many years there have been attempts at what we would call automated learning i've told you when i was a kid i actually took an old pinball machine and adapted it so you could you know you could answer questions with it and i called it a teaching machine and later on when languages first came out there was a language called logo and there was another one that you know, used the uh, mouse cursor movements uh, based on Logo, which was designed specifically to be a teaching language. There have been machines, teaching machines. Um, uh, some of these other schools I've talked about, these private schools that are outside the system, many times when they got computers, the first thing they did is put as much of their knowledge base on it. So like uh, I went to DeVry Technical Institution to learn electronics at one point, and they had actually computerized many, many, many of the classes with a program called Socrates. And I could sit there and just pretty much have fun exploring electronics on my own. And then I had a teacher online that I could either talk to or send email to. I didn't have to go to that building or that classroom to get that knowledge. They would send me materials, which I would then construct or put together and send back as a test and then eventually got my degree online through through that. Later I went to a, a brick and mortar university. Why has there been a resistance to all of this? Why isn't there more of it? And it has been the politics have tried to stop it. Unions, teaching unions have stopped it. Uh, the public education system itself has done whatever they could to discourage it and even the little bit that they have in schools, they haven't done a very good job of um, using it in a wise way. So we have this internet now that has all of this bundle of information and we're not showing people how to access it and how to take advantage of it. And we have a psychology in this world that we can't learn this from a machine. What, what kind of nonsense is that? Um, if people told me I couldn't learn anything by going to a library, I would have told them they were out of their mind. You know? <laughs> yeah, I guess I also argue, I mean, there is a real danger in the idea of having teachers. I mean, in, in a sense, because so, so many subjects have a subtlety to them to, uh, regarding right. perspective. And, and how, how they see the subject is sort of important to how the students are going to end up seeing the subject. I, I noticed that in science that, you know, it didn't occur to me until after I got out of school that you know, here they were separating these sciences, you know, physics, chemistry, and biology, and it's really one subject. You really can't separate chemistry from physics, and you really can't separate chemistry from biology. So, you know, this was, you know, they fooled me, you know, by making it seem like these were separate entire worlds when, no, this was one world they decided to cut into pieces. And that, that cutting, it's the same thing with geometry, and um, like you could say algebra 
they made these separate disciplines and you're saying how can you separate them the math of angles and and uh, geometry you know and then trigonometry even how can you Tra separate these exactly. subjects when they're all the same subject yeah I, I often regretted that I had not learned uh, any chemistry when I was in high school and college but then in my later years I sat down and when I discovered that all of chemistry was electronics and that I already knew electronics and so I started looking at it from that point of view and I went through a Linus Pauling book which is you know about 9,000 pages and took a couple of online courses and before long I realized oh chemistry is just nothing but electronics and I realized I had already known it I had I had known a lot of it already my entire life I just didn't know I didn't know it because of these domains they have around subjects and these domains are just they're fake fences they yeah. are really fake fences and I think they just limit your capacity to, to learn because you don't you need to get this from a couple of different points of view and and compare those points of view and see and and you know I, it you just seems like that's the way you fall into a better pattern of figuring how to keep the knowledge in your own head is that you have to formulate the way that fits for you and and I think that can be you know there can be a lot of you know you have to do that in in pieces that make sense to you and if you have some piece or some piece of knowledge somebody's forced in there you have to get that out. So it's the kind of thing, the garbage in, garbage out. Well, sometimes it's hard to get a piece of garbage out of your own head, a notion that has, that has stalled or prevented you from getting the simplicity of something, like the idea that math is just formulas and that formulas are a description of relationships. I mean, until I understood that, it was, you know, math was just some sort of thing I didn't understand, that it was almost memorizing the way it worked rather than understanding what it meant. Like when something was squared, it literally meant it was squared. It was the square of an angle and it was the area of the square and it was, you know, that just made so much sense. Yeah, I explained to my students, it's like chess. There's two ways of playing the game. You can play by the rules and follow all the rules and worry about all the moves and the next moves. But the great chess players are thinking strategy. It has nothing to do with the moves at all. It has to do with what you're going to do with the moves. It's a larger point of view that they're having about something. That's what happens when the domains of subjects break down. Other subjects start bringing in these other points of view about this one little thing that you're focused in on. You're thinking about chemistry here or one thing in chemistry and all of a sudden you read something about literature in history that suddenly strikes a chord in your head. The subjects start to break down and they start uh, cross-firing, as you will, and reinforcing these ideas that you're trying to dig out of it. Yeah, I, th I just think the argument is, is that rigidity isn't a good thing and that teachers no. bring a lot of rigidity and the idea is to give, you know, is to find, a person should find a teacher that complements their psychology in terms of the way they present information that might m make it more understandable and that that's a more sensible road to go than to make it all dependent on some teacher in some particular high school in some particular town is going to dictate whether your kid's going to get it or not and that shouldn't be what dictates it and be, be, be that shouldn't be what's controlling and just the, you know just for perspective just understand this is all redundant teachers do the same thing year in year out the same course the same course material reading it out of the same book and you're just paying them to show up to do a live performance that I think we all know can be done with a medium like this just as well yeah, yes, exactly. Uh, it's a really good resource to use, and it's really important that people take whatever theories or ideas they have and make them practical. So I always like building a product from it, you know. Uh, it's not enough that I learned something about music this week. I want to write something, and I want it to have an emotional impact on people. And when I perform it and I see that come back at me, I know I've created a product from that. Now that idea is uh, more alive, more real, more three-dimensional, more, more purposeful than just having it float around in my head as well. And uh, the more different subjects, I, I remember when I actually got 
the idea for my music theory when I was reading the history of music. And then one day I started reading a little book on poetry, and I was reading this other little book on machines called Connections. And I realized that they were all showing me the same thing. They were showing the evolution of human consciousness and that it was happening in stages throughout history. And it's quantized, it, it like leaps, and then all of a sudden whole new areas open up in literature, in art, in science, in social uh, habits, in economics, all across the board. People have explored with this new idea, this new thinking, and then all of a sudden there's another quantum leap in human consciousness, and then you see this across the board again. So to isolate the subjects into very rigid domains that have a timeline and a linear way of studying it is not the way consciousness grows at all anyway. Yeah, so it's, it's really just, you know, I, I just think this is, the, you know, we, we're, it's, the system's too myopic, too narrow, and we have the technology to make it, you know, the, to, to, to open it wide open, and the idea of um, um, incentivizing just makes you know, paying kids instead of teachers just makes infinite sense in this environment. We have the technology to do it, and it's the only rational thing to do <laughs> for your kids, uh, for the future.